rides well though, doesn't it? The weight of our mountain bikes is absolutely and unequivocally a performance metric, but should it be? Because sometimes it can feel like a hangover from the days that we transitioned from well-paved roads onto, well, slightly less well-paved roads. And I sometimes wonder what relevance it holds today now that we've graduated onto what modern mountain biking is. Now, there is of course something of a movement to get you back on slightly less well-paved roads. And if you want to be bored to tears, you can always ask Mike Levy about it and why there's nothing quite like the exhilaration of having your crotch numbed by washboard roads at 30 kilometers an hour. I was born on a gravel road though, Max. I love this. Anybody see my gravel bike? Now, a lot of you will be watching this thinking, I ride cross country, cross country, XC, and that is what real mountain biking is to me. Now, as someone who can't even say the bloody thing, maybe I don't have the authority to disagree with you, but I would contend that to most mountain bikers, trail and enduro riding is what they consider to be mountain biking. Now, modern XC and the modern XC bike is absolutely fantastic. And that's because it's managed to include a whole lot of fun whilst fundamentally honoring what it was good at in the first place. And that is covering large amounts of ground very quickly. When trying to go quickly uphill, weight is obviously important. And you have to be pretty ignorant to say that it doesn't matter. However, what's important to one individual in one context might not necessarily hold water in another. For instance, some might agonize over how many grams of protein they want to eat, whereas some of us only really care what color of Oreo we go for. But why, oh why, oh why, are we using it for performance metric for anything other than something like this. This is a bike we've got in for review at the moment. It is the Factor Lando XC, and it's all the things that a modern XC bike can be. It's sleek, it's fast, it's light, and it's absolutely beautiful. Plus, it's got as much remote control as a Chinese weather balloon. Incidentally, I heard the weather that day was massive submarines. But should enduro and trail bikes be beholden to the same standards? Now, before I start pontificating and prepping my soapbox, weight, absolutely, that's not all right, does matter to some of you. Of course it does. But I would argue, to many of us, it's another marketing tool that merely attaches an arbitrary number to a bike. Yes, of course, it affects how well a bike climbs, but I would even contend that often it's not the defining feature. But because of the compromises we make, because of weight, we give away so much performance. This obsession needs to go away and go away forever. Now let's think of one of the most obvious examples for me, our tires. Because if we use the example of our frames, there's no reason not to have a lighter frame, providing it can take the same amount of abuse. The real issue is when we put keeping the weight of our bikes down, so high up in the list of our priorities. We pursue low weight, but what we end up with is bikes with low performance. So today I wanna to take a look at two different tires that are in the same tread and compound, albeit in different casings and therefore weights, and talk about how they ride so differently. Here we have some tires from the direct-to-consumer brand Versus. Now this isn't a review, that will come later, nor is this some kind of promotion. Today, I just wanted to use these tires as an example to talk about how weight is intrinsically linked to performance, but how it might not be lower, the better. To do this, we need the help of our tamed bicycle racer. Some say this is intellectual property of Top Gear and we're not allowed to rip it off. but some others say their BBC lawyers won't pursue us in North America. Some other people say that he's got severe asthma and he shouldn't be left in a contained space with a smoke machine. All I know is he's got comprehensive life insurance. It's our in-house bicycle racer, Mr. Matt Beer.
what we are going to do is have Matt run a few laps of this fast, rough descent and alternate between the casings. There'll be the trail casing, which weighs around a thousand grams, and the gravity casing, which weighs a whopping 1500 grams. Now, in a game of splitting hairs, that 500 grams difference per tire is absolutely huge. Firstly, you're gonna have to run that tire at higher pressures, and that's because a thinner sidewall will be more vulnerable to punctures or even rim damage. That means the tire then rebounds faster, which is the exact inverse of what you want when you're riding slippy tech or wet routes. A thinner sidewall tire will also do an inferior job of supporting the wheel as we lean the bike and put our load laterally through the tire. Meaning that, again, you have to account for this through higher pressure. This then not only feeds into the first problem, but gives us a tire with less grip to begin with. In terms of our suspension setup, it can have an effect too. A greater mass will take more energy to accelerate it. This means heavier tires, which are fundamentally harder to bully around, will take the edge off your compression spikes before they even reach the suspension in the first place. Matt, going between those tires back to back, could you feel the difference? Could you feel that 500 grams either way? Oh yeah, hands down. And in terms of descending, which ones had the most benefit? 100%, it had to be the heavier tires. And why do you think that was? They just absorbed everything a little bit slower and sort of dampened things down a bit. Mm, and if you were thinking about climbing on the bike, could you notice that? Could you tell any difference in acceleration? Yeah, when you put the heavier tires on, it felt like somebody was pulling me backwards down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> if you were specking your 170mm Enduro bike, which way would you lean in terms of tires, heavier or lighter? As someone who focuses on descending, I would go with the heavier tires because they give more grip. I think across the industry, brands are definitely getting better at embracing heavier bike parts to increase performance. And it's good to see more enduro bikes as standard coming with heavier tires. You see, I have nothing against that XO Plus style casing, and it really does depend on where you live, I suppose. But if you've got a bike with a modern geometry and 170 mil big fork, making these enormous checks in terms of bike performance, we definitely need tires that can cash them. Another area you can improve the performance of your bike is definitely the brakes. When it comes to leading the charge, TRP are definitely on the front foot, offering rotors as big as 223 mil and as thick as 2.3 millimeters. Because if you wanna improve the performance of your bike, heavier brakes are definitely a good place to start. In recent years, there's also been a trend to make suspension heavier. I'm talking bigger fork legs, more oil and coil sprung IFPs. Now with our shocks, it's not always apples to apples, as some frames prefer a certain type of spring rate. And I think between friends, we can also acknowledge that certain frames don't really gel well with coil shocks and much prefer the larger shaft of an air shock to give some much needed stiffness. But few of us would disagree that a well set up coil shock on the right bike is anything other than fantastic. And that's not even starting on drivetrains. It was a couple of years ago that SRAM brought out their eight-speed e-bike specific EX1. Now it had pretty decent range for the time. It was meant to be a heavier, burlier group set. And isn't that what the comment section is crying out for? But for one reason or another, it didn't quite take off. But there were also some elements of e-bike snobbery, which I would contend should be tempered with a bit of pragmatism. You see, that drivetrain Whilst it was okay, it should have been reassuringly heavy like an expensive fountain pen, but actually it felt almost agricultural and quite basic. If you were specking up a bike and you had to choose between that eight-speed EX1 or Shimano XT or SRAM GX of the time, let's face it, you wouldn't be reaching for the eight-speed setup. Now, of course, we have a second bite of the cherry with Shimano Link Glide, which is a heavier group set available from Shimano in 10 or 11 speed, which is in Dior or XT respectively. And speaking of heavy, it really is heavy. This is Mastodon compared to Miley Cyrus. This XT cassette is the better part of a kilo. It's 780 grams, which is about 350 grams heavier than a standard XT 11 speed cassette. Link Glide is also not trying to be hyperglide. You see, whereas the old family tree of Shimano was pretty much as straight and as direct as a rural fishing community in Norfolk, 
This new system will sit parallel to Hyperglide and it will have its own XT and Dior levels respectively. So Hyperglide isn't going anywhere and it's not trying to. It's there to give the lightest weight performance and the best shift per gram. Whereas the Link Glide isn't constrained by the same limitations in terms of weight. So it's heavier and it's chunkier, but to what end? Well, it's all in the name of longevity with some pretty bold claims of increasing durability by 300%. Now I've got this group set in for review at the moment, but it got me thinking, is this wide range group set with less gears and at a weight penalty, the kind of group set that you and I should be riding? Now, is the effect of having an e-bike drivetrain on our bikes gonna drastically change our experience of pedaling up, over and around the mountains? Well, I would say probably not. However, it doesn't have to just be a guessing game because thanks to old lady science, we can work it out. Now, Seb Stott explained it to me. It's not photosynthesis, that's something different. I'm pretty sure on algorithms like Facebook, but I'm not too sure. Either way, Sebi Zuckerberg did tell me that if I knew certain key elements about my bike, the rider and the climb, you can work out how weight changes affect the duration. For instance, if we took an 80 kilogram rider and let them climb up a two kilometer 10% grade at a steady but constant 200 watts on a 14 kilogram ish bike, it would take them around 18 minutes and 15 seconds. And if they did what I did, which is add a huge 3.3 kilograms to my bike with all these heavier parts, it would only take them around 35 seconds longer. And I think that trade-off isn't so bad. So what was the Spire is now the HMS sizable. I've added 400 grams to the wheels, 1800 grams going to heavier tires and including inserts, and an e-bike drivetrain and coil shock. The total weight penalty is 3.3 kilograms. But is it really that much better? But all of that taken into account, and honestly, it's not half bad. When you're getting up to speed, you do notice it. It's a bit like getting into really cold water. And once you've plunged in, there's a bit of a shock, but once you get moving, your body kind of balances that out. And I would say, to be honest, that climbing performance has so many other factors like grip and balance and geometry and sometimes kind of rider skill. Now, this bike climbs pretty well. Yes, it is heavy. And when you're up something steep and pinchy, you do have to put down the horses a bit, but I would say then rather losing a kilo or two off the bike weight, a low range gear is gonna be what helps you in that situation. Is it sprightly? Absolutely not, but it's still perfectly adequate on the climbs. You know, if you have more of a focus on going downhill and that's what you enjoy, I'd really invite you to open up to the idea of having a bike that weighs more because you might get something that performs better, lasts longer, and potentially even costs less. Now it's definitely got to be said that it's often not best to come to a solution by jumping between two extremes. And I'm not encouraging you to do that. However, the art is in the compromise and that's what the modern enduro bike is. It is a great compromise. However, I would like it biased a bit more towards longevity and downhill performance. You know, I remember maybe five years ago and it felt like it would only be a couple of months or maybe even once or twice a year before your CSU started the mating call of an adolescent cricket as it creaked and cracked incessantly. However, I think that the modern enduro fork, mainly because it's got heavier, has largely remedied this. And I'm not suggesting that we go and bolt downhill forks onto our enduro bikes, but I do think about the elements of change that I've enjoyed most in bike design in the last couple of years, whether that's bigger brakes and forks on down country bikes, whether that's something like tire inserts. And often, a lot of time, I felt it to be a really positive change. So I'm not suggesting to go to an extreme place or try and make your bike as heavy as possible, but I am suggesting that you entertain the idea of 1300 gram tires, of coil shocks, of e-bike drivetrains, and definitely of bigger, heavier brake rotors. It's not the solution to all your problems, but it is gonna be a solution to some of the problems that some of you hard-hitting riders experience, 
and especially those hard-hitting riders who demand a lot of performance. And that's it, I've said my bit. I'm gonna go hide from the internet in the comments for a couple of weeks and live in a tent in the woods. Thank you very much for watching though. I hope it's been some good food for thought. Special thanks to Matt Beer who forgot his inhaler and didn't have a great time, but good on him, what a guy. I'll see you later, cheers guys. <coughs> Help, you left the tile lock on. Guys, I need some water, it's not funny anymore. <coughs> I'm telling Brian about this.